as I grow as a Christian, I'm increasingly fascinated by the Garden of Eden and everything that was there and all the meaning that God put in the garden and the immense tragedy of the fall that happened seemingly hours and maybe at most days after, after God created Adam and Eve. Those first moments of the Bible hang over the rest of the Bible. The Bible never escapes the essence, the categories, the memories of Eden. And the Bible crescendos back in a garden, a garden city with the tree of life there and a river of life and all the rest. So this is the, the grid on which the Bible takes place. And those first images and thoughts and, and, and the, those longings we have, that nostalgia, if you want to call it that, that longing for lost paradise, for lost Eden, that lives inside every one of us. We have that. And the Bible is the only book that teaches us about that place and teaches us about our destiny. But the first moments hang over the rest. And to this very day, that terrible thing that happened, the fall, when sin entered into God's world, when our first parents, Adam and Eve, who had, who had righteousness at their fingertips, it wasn't difficult for them to walk in the ways of righteousness. It was, it was who they were. But God allowed them the ability to fall, which they did. And to this very hour, the fall casts its very ugly shadow over all of life. To borrow the words of a man named Morpheus, the fall is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church when you pay your taxes. The fall has permeated everything, has it not? Well, let us consider today the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ from the perspective of the fall, because this is the true setting of the incarnation. The Lord Jesus became one of us in creation, but it was in a fallen creation. So that's the true context of the incarnation. As we consider this passage, which is it's both New Testament and Old, so this is perfect. There's no complaints here. In Hebrews 10 slash Psalm 40. Uh, I just want to do two things today. First, I want to consider four ways that I can see at least that this passage teaches us that Jesus was incarnated in a fallen world. In a fallen world. And then we will consider... Just a couple of things of what this means for us here today. And that will be our sermon. So first, four ways this passage tells us that Jesus entered, when He came here, a fallen world. Uh, first, the passage teaches us about the moment of His coming. And moment there, I don't mean in the uh, classic sense of weightiness. If you, you avid Puritan readers, you know this word. The moment of something means it's weight or significance. That's not what I mean here. I mean the moment as in the time of His coming, the moment of His coming, uh, which takes place, the psalmist tells us, after the sacrifices and offerings of the Old Testament. I want to read again from verse 5. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And then verse 6. Uh, in burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Uh, the mosaic institution of bloody sacrifices by the hands of priests had been going on for a very long time before the Lord Jesus Christ was born. It was to him, <laughs> to, to his day, it was an ancient custom and institution that had been around for I don't know, 1,400 years, 1,200 years, scholars are divided. It had been around a long time. And this means that His coming took place after the institution of those sacrifices. And if those sacrifices teach us anything at all, they teach us that the world we live in is fallen. The sacrifices were gruesome and bloody. We're not used to them. I don't know if any of you guys you know, worked, ever worked in a butcher shop, but... That would be more similar to the priesthood of Israel than maybe anything else that we have here today. Gruesome, bloody, sacrifice, death, 
gross. Uh, the, the priests lived in death. Adam was surrounded by all the animals of the garden in life, but now God's priests must be surrounded by those animals in death. And those animals were offered endlessly. There's a sense of endlessness to the sacrifices in Israel. Every day, every morning, every night, not to mention all the special days and feasts, and not to mention all the special sin sacrifices for various sins that were committed. Their religious life was dominated by death and bloodshed and sacrifice. And this teaches us that the world is fallen. That's not how God created the world. When God placed Adam in the garden and surrounded him with those magnificent creatures, they were to be his friends, his companions in a way, not his special companions, but they were the, all Adam's pets. When I was in Kenya you know, three years ago, I, I, took, I was on a safari. And uh, man, that's, that's, that was my comment, was as I'm watching the lions and all the other stuff, rhinos, those rhinos are crazy. And there's like panthers in the trees you got to watch out for. But that was my thought, Adam's pets. That's what these are. And sin has done such a number on this world and ruined everything, has it not? Christ's coming after the sacrifices teaches us that His coming was into a gruesome, bloody, treacherous, fallen world. It's a fallen world. It's the moment of His coming. Uh, but secondly... The passage teaches us about the manner of His coming, and this also teaches us that He entered into a fallen world. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. Let me just say a word about that while we're there. Uh, does this mean that God did not institute the sacrifices? I mean, wasn't it God who said, these are the sacrifices you should make, this is exactly how I want you to make it, and this is when I want you to make them? Of course He did. This was the law of the Lord given through Moses. And it was all laid out for them exactly what they should do. You've read Leviticus. At least you've started it. I don't know if you've ever finished it, but it's all in there. And that's the word of the Lord. But when he says here that sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, what he means is not that God didn't institute them, but that they're not ultimate. They're not ultimate. Another way to say it is they don't really accomplish anything. It is Hebrews that tells us that sacrifices and offerings of bulls and goats do not take away sin. It is impossible, he says, for these sacrifices to take away sin. They didn't do anything to sin. Nothing. They created a ceremonial cleanness for the people so that they could dwell with God physically in His temple in the physical land of Israel. But they didn't actually accomplish anything by way of washing away sin. Jesus is the only one who accomplished that. And the sacrifices of the Old Testament only had value for that in as much as they pictured for the people of Israel the sacrifice to come. Those Israelites that could see, let's just take a random one, I don't know, the Passover lamb, that could see in the Passover lamb a figure of the promised one to come who would be sacrificed for our sins, which the Bible tells us as early as Genesis 3.15, that He would suffer to save us. The Israelites that saw in that the coming promised Son of God, the Son of Abraham and the Son of David, they were saved. Their sins were forgiven, but not by virtue of those bulls and goats, but by virtue of what those pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ in His reality. So when the psalmist says here, and quoting God, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. This is Christ talking to God, so you know it's true. Um, when he says this, what he means is the sacrifices are not ultimate. They serve their purpose, but they're not the end. Uh, he's the end. His body's the end. His sacrifice is the end. The only true and real sacrifice ever was the offering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else beautifully, wonderfully, strikingly pictures and figures that sacrifice. So that's what he means when he says he has not desired those things. Right? And that's where the children of Israel went wrong so often is they just started to attach their godliness to going through the motions. They did the stuff. They made the sacrifice. They, they tied the money. They did all the stuff. And they thought that was it. But they didn't pierce through all of that to God in those things. Uh, okay, so here we say the manner of his coming teaches us. Now, uh, the manner of His coming is, of course, in a body here, as verse 5 tells us, a body 
have you prepared for me? Now, I didn't get into this last week, but those scholars of you in the room who are familiar with Psalm 40 will know that in Psalm 40, verse 6, from which this is quoted, it reads a little bit differently. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but you have given me an ear, some translations read. And the Hebrew word in Psalm 40, verse 6, is ear. Ear. Is that what I'm talking about ear? An ear you have given for me, or you have bored an ear for me, is what it says, uh, in the Hebrew. Here we're in the New Testament, and uh, the writer of Hebrews um, uses a different word in the Greek, which comes from the Septuagint Old Testament, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it is the word body. It's not the word ear. It's the word body. So what's happening here? Is there a manuscript corruption? Well, it's a puzzler, no doubt about it. But uh, as, far as, I, 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 as far as I can see, I, I think the most legitimate solution is as follows. And there's several, several solutions to this problem. Uh, from scholars who believe in the Word of God, in other words, believe that there is no true contradiction here, but in fact that this teaches us something, this dual interpretation. Probably the best way to think about Hebrews chapter 10 here is as an interpretation of the original Hebrew of Psalm 40, an interpretation of the divine intent and meaning or extrapolation of what was there. So what does the body have to do with an ear? What does a body have to do with an ear? Uh, so um, some scholars believe that, uh, that the ear here that's given to Christ in Psalm 40 is the, is the ear of listening to God's will, which he mentions in verse 7, God's will in the scriptures. Uh, the ear of discipleship where uh, he was given an ear to understand the Old Testament sacrifices and what they pointed to. And then beyond that, to understand why he was here and what he was called to do. He had an ear that could understand God's word and God's will. That's an option. Others take it as a synecdoche, which is a very fancy word. Synecdoche, which means, and we use this all the time, uh, when a part stands for the whole, right? When a part stands for the whole. Uh, I guess the most famous example is if you say the suits. The suits walked in. You're talking about the businessmen, right? You're not just talking about the fabric that they're wearing. They're the suits. And that part of them represents who they are fully. Uh, they take the ear as a synecdoche of the entire body. That if he gave him an ear, that he certainly gave him an entire body as well. The ear being part of the body. And so the ear there is a synecdoche. The third option, which I find the most compelling personally, uh, is, is that it's a reference to uh, the Mosaic Law. Uh, you might be familiar with this. In uh, Exodus 21, if a slave at the year of Jubilee, which was when all the slaves, the Israelite slaves were set free, year of Jubilee, that'd be cool to have one else sometime uh, for other things, but year of Jubilee every 50 years, right? Uh, what happened is slaves were set free, but the slaves were given an option. Let's say there was a slave who loved his master. He was part of the household. He didn't want to go out. He wanted to stay with his master. What would happen is, according to Mosaic law, he would stand against the door and his master would drive you know, like an earring through his ear, you know, drive a hole into his ear, boom. And that would be a symbol that he would remain in the household of his master forever willingly, that he was giving himself and his whole body willingly to serve under his master. And I think that that is the most compelling reference that's probably in Psalm 40, uh, because the, the Psalm 40 is written in such a way where it's like the boring, you have bored for me an ear. There's a boring going on. And so that piercing of the ear in Hebrews, in Exodus 21, seems to me what's probably going on here. In other words, what, if, that's, if that's what this is, then what Christ is saying is the, the body that was prepared for him by the Father, he gives freely to his Father's service. That he came as a willing servant of God and that he put his ear against that door and it was bored as a symbol of his willingness to serve God fully. And we see that pattern in the life of Christ, do we not? Not my will, but thy will be done. That he doesn't speak of his own will, but he speaks in accordance with everything the Father tells him. When Jesus lived, his disposition was entirely that of the servant of the Father, wasn't it? He emptied himself and served the will of God in heaven. As the man, Jesus Christ, he did that. And so it seems to me that this earpiece and this body piece 
What it really means here is that he is God's slave. Slave. That he is God's servant. And even though he does this willingly, slavery of, in this manner, servanthood, restraint, this sort of thing, that's really something that goes along with sin. Sin is, is what brings restraint and slavery and servitude into the world. In Eden, there was such a freedom amongst Adam and Eve. And yes, certainly they were God's servants, but it was all free. It was free air in Eden. But with the coming of sin, even when God starts to work redemption, like through the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant is marked by this servanthood. It's called a legal covenant. It's a binding covenant. And it's full of stipulations. And the whole vibe that the Mosaic Covenant gives you when you read it is, yo, you, like, you were like, stuck. And that's right. That's the way that God made it. Paul talks about that. He says that it was our tutor to lead us to Christ. There was a binding nature to the Old Covenant. But that's because of sin. And so this also teaches us that He entered a sinful world because when our Lord became one of us, He didn't come with chariots and fanfare and crowns and thrones. He could have. He came as a servant and as God's slave. He came as somebody who wasn't His own. His body He gave to God and His purposes and His will. And so this also teaches us that He entered this fallen world. And, and that's, what, that's what's true of us. That's what our baptisms signify. That we belong head to toe to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am His. And so whatever I do with this body, I do unto Him. What I see with my eyes, I see for Him. What I hear with my ears, I hear for Him. What I work with my hands, I work unto Him so that I might lift clean hands and praise unto God. Where my feet take me, they take me for His purposes. And Jesus' incarnation as the infant, <laughs> that's what it pictures for us. The body was prepared for Him that He might serve God in a sinful world to accomplish God's purposes in a sinful place. This body that the Lord had, has, but it, you know, it's been glorified, the old body of the Lord. We know that He wasn't tainted by sin. He never sinned. But He experienced all the effects of sin. All the bad stuff that happens in the world because of our fall, Jesus walked in. He experienced. He tasted. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But this body that God prepared for him, it also teaches us that he entered a fallen world. And that's the entire theater of his incarnation. Thirdly here, the text uh, teaches us the motion of his coming or where it's going. And this also teaches us that he entered a fallen world. This text has the fall all over it. The motion of his coming. His journey here was to end in death. Nothing short of it. Death. That's why He came. For this purpose He came, to fulfill the shadows of the Old Covenant. His, when Jesus thinks and talks here, because He's the one talking in Psalm 40, when He says, a body you have prepared for Me, it is couched within two statements about sacrifice. That's all He's thinking about with His body. Sacrifice. Sacrifices and offerings you have desired not, but the body you've prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you've taken no pleasure. It is couched within the context of death. Death. He knew that. As soon as the Lord Jesus was conscious of himself as a human being and was conscious of who he was, which we'll get into a little bit, he realized that his body was the sacrifice. That He was born in a unique way to die. You and I were not born to die in a very real way. We were not born to die. We were born to live. We're God's creatures. But He was born uniquely. He was born for the single purpose of dying for sin. And that's what His body was. The motion of His coming goes this way. He partook of flesh and blood, chapter 2 tells us of our flesh and blood, so that through death He might destroy the one who has the power of death. The whole purpose and trajectory of the baby in the manger 
is so that he can grow into a righteous man and that that righteous man can be nailed to a tree and can drink the judgment of God for us. That's the name of the game of the incarnation. And any conception of the incarnation apart from that, apart from sin and, and the doing away with sin in the death of Christ, it falls infinitely short of what's actually happening when God the Son became one of us. And then fourthly here, another, another way that this passage teaches us that he entered a fallen world is the mention of his coming. The way that it's mentioned. Uh, we see this in, the, in a few places. It, in verse 5, consequently when Christ came into the world, he said, and then the quote comes from, uh, it doesn't come from the New Testament. It doesn't come from the Gospels. It doesn't come from some side source. You know, there's other places in the New Testament besides the Gospels where Christ speaks. If you've got a red-letter Bible, you'll find red letters in Acts. Did you know that? Not just at the beginning of Acts either. You'll find red letters in Revelation. You'll find Christ speaking throughout the rest of the New Testament. But that's not what this is. This is a quote from the Old Testament Scriptures from Psalm 40, as we've said for the 40th time now. It's from the Bible. And so the mention of his coming is mentioned in Scripture. Uh, but he says this more explicitly. So now, this is, pre this is like a Bibleception. Okay, so, so Hebrews is quoting the Bible, and then the Bible is talking about the Bible in verse 7 here. There's a quotes within quotes, okay? In verse 7, Behold, I have come to do your will, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now, what does that mean? That is the rowdiest way I've ever heard the Bible described, the scroll of the book. It is written of me in the scroll of the book. Uh, so Psalm 40 mentions his coming in the scroll of the book. But in Psalm 40, Christ says that really the whole thing mentions his coming that the entire old testament is really about this it's really written about him we know that right it's written of me he said that it's about me it tells you about me and he he says it's written in the scroll of the book before i mention how this really teaches us about the fall i just want to point out here think about it. this is jesus talking jesus is saying this i've come to do your will O god as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Jesus knew the Bible was about him. And as he's praying to the Father and, and dedicating himself to God to do his singular will of dying for our sins, he's mentioning the Bible. Did you know? And this is going to sound very unorthodox. This might sound heretical to you. But this is, this is capital O old school orthodoxy right here. As Jesus grew up as a little boy, and as a young man, he learned about who he was from reading the Bible. He learned. He didn't, wasn't born into this world with this super consciousness about who he was from the moment he was born. Because then he would be superhuman and not human. He was truly human as one of us. And in his human nature, he learned. The Bible teaches us this. He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. He's growing. You see a different Christ when he's 12 years old in the temple than you do when he's 30 and he's preaching on the scene. Why? Because he's grown. How did he grow? From reading the Bible. He learned who he was from reading that book. He grew in conviction and strength and clarity about what he was called to be from the book. That's amazing. But the way this teaches us about the fall is because, well, the existence of Scripture at all indicates a fall, beloved. The very existence of the Bible itself teaches us that we live in a fallen world. Before the fall, there was no need for a Bible. God walked with man, and man walked with God. They heard His voice. They knew Him. Face to face, they knew Him in the garden. They knew God's presence. They knew His power. They knew His will. They had a perfect relationship with God. Flawless relationship with God. They didn't need the Bible. The Bible, by its very existence, 
teaches us that we live in a fallen world because now communication has broken down. And God communicates us with us in a different way. Now, the Bible is exceedingly glorious. It's a creation. It's not, it's not eternal in the sense that it's always existed. It's God-breathed, and it, it will exist forever, and it cannot be assailed, and it cannot be broken. But the Bible is an outflowing from God, a revelation of who He is, and it is exceedingly precious, and it is perfectly fitted for this fallen world. In other words, out of all the things that can help you through this life, the Bible's the best that there is. It's the very best that there is. Your feelings go up and down. Your mental antennas are better some days than others, are they not? Your memory is foggy sometimes and clearer other times. Anything that was dependent on your memory, even of God's voice, or just your sense of what He was saying, is not fitted for this fallen world where sin has darkened us. It's dulled our understanding and it has twisted our emotions and we are incapable of walking with God like that. So we need the book. The book where the, where the letters are in black and white. Where it doesn't change. Where the grammar is rock solid. Where it, there's a scientific nature to the Bible. Where it's just straight up linguistic science and it teaches us the will of God. And it is exceedingly precious and fitted for this world. But incidentally, it does teach us that we live in a fallen stage. The time will come, not when the Bible passes away, beloved. The Bible will live on forever and ever. The truths of the Bible. But I do not suspect that in the new heavens and the new earth, you will wake up and do your little morning devos with your Bible. Because you're going to see him. And when you see him, you're going to be made into his likeness. And when you see him, you're going to see things you didn't notice the day before in eternity. And you're going to grow. And you're going to walk with him. And he will be with us. And he will speak to us. And we will see him. We will touch him. We will know him. We will hear him. He's ours and we're his. And the Bible will pass away in that sense. But while we're here, we need it. While we're here, it is the only portal that shows us that other realm where God lives. But the Bible doesn't just teach us that we live in a fallen world. The presence of the Bible also teaches us that there's grace. That's what the Bible is. If it was only God's judgment after our fall into sin, there would be no Bible. There'd be no more words from heaven. Maybe God would let us live out our lives in sin, but then He would judge us after we died. But there'd be no communication. God will cut Himself off from us. Uh, it's not what He did. Praise God. He did not do that. He gave promises. He gave prophets. And eventually, He gave Scripture, which is our treasure. It opens the lines of communication back up with heaven. And when that line of communication opened up with heaven, there was one theme, there was one subject. There was only one. Christ is the subject of the Bible. There's somebody coming is the promise. There's somebody who's going to become one of us. So the promise of His coming, which He says here in Psalm 40, is, is foundational to all of Scripture. It's the foundation of the Bible. The very first thing that God said after we fell was that somebody would come and undo the works of the serpent. He would suffer while he did it, but he would do it. That's what the entire Bible is built upon in Genesis 3.15. And Christ knows that. And Christ references that here. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. And if anyone ever knew what the Bible was about, it's Jesus. So, as in this fallen world, when your lines of communication with God are prayer and His Word... And you cling to your Bible. I'm clinging to this is an iPad, right? It's, the game has changed. But the Bible, it's Lagos Bible software. The Bible, you look for Christ. That's who it's about. You're going to miss the Bible unless you look for Him everywhere in the Bible. Okay, well, that's just four ways that this passage teaches us that Jesus entered into a fallen realm and a fallen world. Uh, secondly here, I just want to consider a couple things of what this means for us. Apply this to us. There are many ways we could do this. I just got two, okay? And then we're done. 
One, what this means for us, is that we shouldn't try to ignore the fallen nature of the world, of, of, the, of our lives. It's not something we should be trying to ignore. Uh, God owns it everywhere in His Word, and as we see, Jesus Himself owned it when He came here. He knew exactly what this was, and He didn't ignore the fall, and neither should we. It's not godly to try to ignore the corrupting effects of sin. And, and by that, I, I just mean basically all the bad stuff that happens. The pain, the suffering, the injustice, the breakdowns in communication that happen on big levels and small levels. All that stuff, the mess, call it. We are not to ignore that. We're not to try to go above that and pretend it's not there. We have to consciously live within that. And as we grow in Christ... And as His Word is filled in us more mightily, then we become more able to walk within that, conscious of it. Conscious that yo, when I'm talking, people might not be hearing what I'm saying because there's breakdowns. Or when I'm hearing somebody, I might not be hearing them right. I might want to double check that this is really what they're saying before I go off and write a blog about them, you know, or whatever. But that's just an example. Uh, when you wake up and you got plans for tomorrow, you're going to wake up, you're going to do this. You got to remember, if God wills it, you'll do that because anything could happen. You could wake up sick. You could wake up feeling terrible. You could have, yo, I'm not old, but I'm, you know, some days you wake up and you just slept funny, man, and that's it. That's it. Plans are ruined because you slept funny. You can't control that stuff. So there's just so many ways that you can't control. So you got to have that locked into your mind. It's a very Christian thing to do, to be really aware of the fallen nature of the world that we live in, because this is what Christ did. We are to face these things, to know that we will encounter them, to store up uh, ammunition against them by way of Scripture and prayer, and to just expect them to happen. Inconveniences, even call them. All of it, down to suffering and instant or unexpected death. Everything in between. Yo, we do not know what's going to happen today. You ever think about that? That's crazy. Today will likely just go on like it, normal, but we don't know that. We don't. It's good to think about that. So we think about those things, but we also think about the sin that made the incarnation necessary. The sin that brings all those suffering things with it. We have to think about the sin itself. We shouldn't try to ignore that sin. And that is wisdom, to face your sin, to square up with it, to try to get a conception of what it is, to try to deal with it, <laughs> to get under the blood. That's wisdom. Face your sin. If you're outside of Christ today, you need to realize that there is a long list of judgment items in your heavenly account, and the cup of God's judgment is filling up. And that's something that you don't need to ignore. That's something you need to face today. You know, if someone's in severe like, debt and spending addiction, that's the first thing you've got to do is cut up the credit cards and look at the debt. You've got to look at it. Would you just look at it? <laughs> but that's what we must do with our sin. We've got to look at it and take it to Christ. That's what we've got to do. Because Christ did that. So that, that's one thing that it means, beloved. And, and you apply that through this week. Don't, don't be surprised. When stuff happens, because stuff happens, that's the world we live in. Secondly here, and lastly, what this means for us is that we have a friend in Jesus. We have a friend here in Him. This is exceedingly precious. He knows what it's like to be you. He, he knows. He knows the, the discouraging morning better than anyone else. He knows the sleepless night better than anyone else. He knows the bodily aches and pains and sufferings. He knows betrayal. Does He not? He knows rejection. And He knows suffering of all kinds. He knows what you walk through. Not because He knows it from afar because He's read a book and studied it. Not even just because He's God and He knows, knows. It's because He's been there. He's been there. And that is the comfort of the Incarnation. That whatever I face, no one might understand. 
And I may feel that, even if others do understand, I may not feel that they understand, but he does. And I know that he does. From the day to day, he's been through it all. Everything we face is nothing new to the Lord Jesus Christ. He experienced all the drab, discouraging days. He experienced all the excitement of the good days. He's experienced the sudden shock of days gone bad on a turn of a dime. He's experienced death of friends and loved ones. All of it. So there's just nothing. Whatever you're going through, beloved, and whatever you go through this week, you've got to take that one. You've got to tell yourself that Christ knows. You've got to talk to Him about it because He knows. It's amazing. He really knows. There's only one Savior, but He's the very best Savior of all. He could not be improved upon in His office of our beloved Savior because He does know us. He experienced all these things, yet without sin, obviously, right? He didn't sin, but he experienced the effects of sin from the moment of his birth onward. His entire life, he bore the burdens of a fallen world. He bore all of that as not participating in the sin of it, but receiving the weight of it upon himself. As we quoted before, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. We're flesh and blood. Uh, so we are. We're fragile. We're dust. We're weak. We're volatile. We're, in, we're, we're unstable in so many ways. He partook of all that. He partook of all that human weakness. The weakness of our emotions. The weakness of our psyche. Our, our mental weakness, the way that our, our, our thinking is connected with our physical state of being. He, he knows all that. And he took all of it. And he did more, he, he had more of it than anyone else. More than me, more than you, more than anybody. He experienced it more deeply. And he knows it more fully. So these are just some considerations. When we think about the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be thinking friend of sinners. Friend of sinners, you have a companion who loves you so very much, whose eyes are always upon you, who always thinks of you. He's always near to you, and he knows what you go through. God became one of us to live and to die for us so that now we could live and die with him. Let's pray. Father, I pray that the truths of your word would be encouragements to us here this morning. Help us to know that we have a friend who is closer to us than our very breath, the Lord Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. I pray that anyone here this morning who doesn't trust Him, not really, who's not serious about Him, would give themselves to Him here today, where they sit. We pray in his name with confidence. Amen.